Hey, listen, man, happy Labor Day, man. How are you excited? Are you excited about Labor Day? Let me hear you. Come on. Dude, y'all don't sound very excited. You know what it means. It's Monday off. Now are you excited? Come on. Now you have one person to be thankful for for that. And you probably don't even know this, but his name, Grover Cleveland. Come on, give it up for Grover. <laughs> y'all are like, what? Here's a picture. Let me put it on the screen for you. This is Grover Cleveland. He is an old school president who understood the value Again, of giving you a day off. I am all about it. 1894, that's how long we've been doing that, all right? So here's what's awesome. Tomorrow, get out by the grill, cook out, do what you want to do, hang out with your friends. But make sure you thank God that you live in the greatest country in the world with the greatest companies and the greatest employees. Come on, y'all. Come on. It's true. Now, I can say that with confidence because, again, I've had the privilege of traveling around the world. And when you get outside of this great United States of America, you understand very quickly just how great we have it. And I am so thankful for the people who own companies, started companies, all the employees that are working and doing all that because it really is the best place in the world to be. And so I'm very, very thankful for that. So enjoy your time with your family and stuff like that tomorrow if you're off. But let's get into today's message. Did a little research, preparing for today, knowing it's Labor Day, knowing that we'll have a little time off. And this was a shocking statistic for me. 85% are happy with their job in America. Do you believe that or disagree with that? Let me hear you. Somebody's like, I don't know. So let's just do a little, let's do a little survey. In this room, if you love your job, let me hear you clap your hands. Come on. Okay. Now remember, your boss is not sitting next to you and it's dark. If you don't like your job, let me hear you. Man, I guess it is. I did this all three hours, and believe it or not, it is true. It seems like there are more and more people loving their job. They appreciate what they're doing. So I'm like, man, that's just shocking. When I did the research, I really wouldn't have thought that. This was the uh, website that, again, 85% of American workers are happy. So you don't think I'm just making this stuff up? I'm like, wow, that's kind of crazy. So then the next little part also researched 76% are not happy with their boss, though. Can I get an amen now? <laughs> See, he's not in here. She's not in here. It's cool. This is where it comes from. It's another website. It's Monster website. It actually, 76% uh, say their boss is toxic. So I'm like, man, that is interesting. So a lot of people love their job, but they really don't like their boss. So, so then I started doing a little bit more research, went to the next level, how many people then are actually starting their own companies? And believe it or not, in America, it is on the uprise. Maybe again, that is why there's so many people that love being self-employed. Anybody self-employed in this room? Let me hear you if you're self-employed. Yeah. Maybe that's what's going on in America. It's like this idea of going, man, I don't really like working for somebody. I'm kind of starting my own company, do my own thing, because that's what's going on. You don't really love your boss. You love what you do, but you don't like who you're working for. So I get it. So then, if you're raising kids in this room, let me hear from you. Can anybody got any kids in here? Okay. We have three teenagers, all right, two in high school, one in middle school, and I can for sure say I heard this phrase occasionally. My kids are pretty good, but I did hear it. And when you talk about self-employed and not liking the boss, you know that you live in a home with kids when you hear this. You're not the boss of me. Anybody ever heard that before? You're not the boss of me. You stay off of me. I'm doing my own thing. You're not the boss of me. Kids say it, man. We are working through that self-employment thing. But just to make it a little bit easier, I found a cute kid, all right? Look at this right here. Look at that. Boss, and you know it, son. If you have kids, many times they're running the house. We get it. But truthfully, our bosses are not this cute. Most of us don't have that good looking of a boss. And when we think of the word boss, most of the time, for most people, it is equal to a bad word in our culture. When somebody says, the boss is coming, you don't, yay! Most of everybody's like, oh, the boss is coming. The boss is in town. I have friends that work again, district manager stuff. They're like, oh, the district manager, everybody, everybody freak out. You know, it's like, oh, there's tension when the boss is coming to town. So it's kind of the way it is. But there is one boss reference that is not a bad word that helps you kind of deal with it. And I need all the old people to recognize as I show you the picture and reflect on the boss. Go ahead and roll it. Springsteen fans, where you at? Come on. Come on, man. That's the boss. Now, 
most of the time, unless you're talking about Springsteen, boss is a bad word, you know? So I grew up, though, and he was called boss. My mom loved him, man. I think it was that whole, uh, you know, that whole glory days and all that stuff. My mom was into that. But here's what's crazy to me is when you get beyond Springsteen and you go back to the boss thing, when you're looking at culture, you understand why boss can be equal to a bad word when you just watch the news and you understand that all across this country, many, many people in authority or in the position of authority are abusing that power. The reason I think that the word boss comes across as a negative thing is because that's what you read about and that's what you see. These are the stories that are out there. You probably maybe even have some own personal stories of working for a boss that you felt like wasn't fair or did the wrong thing. But I'm going to give you some illustrations and this is one abuse of power from one very uh, popular person in our culture that people were very mad at. Holler his name out if you know who he is. Here he is. Anybody know who that is? Bernie Madoff. Now, maybe some of you have forgotten, but rewind the tape when you go back to watching the news. This guy stole a lot of money, and he took the power that he had, and he abused the power, taking advantage of all kinds of people in the way that they invested, in the way that they had their retirements and all this stuff. It was a top story in America. But you know this next story, and it's not just in the business world that you see abuse of power. You also see it in the church world, unfortunately. And here's some of the headlines. Failure at the top. When you look at the news, when you look at our culture, you see that the reason we struggle with, quote, boss or authority is because many times it's an abuse of power. To be specific, here is just one other little image to go along with this, and this is giving you specific numbers of how many priests have abused, uh, you know, children all across this country. This is in one diocese. Now, I know it makes some people very uncomfortable, and I'm with you. But remember, I grew up in the Catholic Church as well. I understand that it's a weird thing that you're going, I don't like this at all. And every time it comes on the news, man, you cringe and you hate to hear the stories. I could give you tons of other examples, but I'm trying to give you one in business and then one in the church, because the church is not, again, separate from it. We're right in the same culture. So when you see the wrong way, and we see it's everywhere, I mean, it's, again, church, business, all these different positions, what's the right way? If we know the wrong way, and we have seen the wrong way, and maybe that's the reason we don't really like authority, and we don't really like bosses, and we don't really like the way things go, because we're not sure we can trust them, What's the right way? Well, the good news is this. We can look into Scripture and we can learn from it. And it does apply to culture today. It applies to your world right now. When you go back out these doors, when this service is over, and you go back to work on Tuesday, for most of us, this message will apply to all of us. Because the world, it is happening. There is abuse of power everywhere. But watch what the all-powerful Jesus did. And let me prove my point. Matthew 28, 18 says this. Jesus said, all power in heaven on earth is given to me. So let me just pause right there. If I gave you all power in heaven and earth right now, Dallas Cowboys are going to the Super Bowl. I can promise you that. <laughs> It'd be my first abuse of power. That would be what happened. Brian Reed, it would be that the Tennessee team could win, all right? The volunteers could win. He had a rough weekend. But jokingly, you know you have certain things you would want. Maybe a nicer house, maybe a nicer car. Maybe you would want your team to win, or you'd want to live here, or you'd want to start this company, and whatever it may be. We have this idea, again, that if we were given all the power, that would be a weird struggle for us. But here's Jesus. All power in heaven and earth have been given to him. Now I'm going to go to John chapter 13 because it continues another passage saying very similar things, but look close. The Father had given Jesus power over what? Everything. Think of this. And Jesus knew it. He knew he had power over everything. People, the planet, 
authority over the rulers. He had power over all of it. And what did he choose to do with it? What does the boss of the world do when all authority in heaven and earth is given to him? How does he respond? What is the thing that he is known for? This is a powerful passage because in John 13, when he's saying this, hey, all authority has been given to me. I'm over everything, guys. What does he do next? Watch this. So while they were eating, Jesus stood up, took off his robe, got a towel, and wrapped it around his waist. And then he poured water into a bowl and began to wash the followers' feet. This is a hard right turn. You would think, well, he's going to tell them how he's going to turn this world around and what he's going to do and knock these people out of authority and put the right people into authority. No. When all authority in heaven and earth is given to him, he chooses to serve. You remember the TV show Undercover Boss? I actually have a picture, right? This is the original. You want to know where they got it from? Right there. The undercover boss, here he is, the man coming on the scene. Instead of demanding what he wants, pulling the finger, telling people what to do, you go do this, you go do that. No, he bows down, takes off his garment to say, I'm even removing any authority I have, and I am going to serve you. This is a radical, different way to lead and be the boss. When you're looking for a boss, when you want to become the boss, whether it's in your home or whether that's at the workplace or at school, is are you a servant? Do you say in your mind, all right, man, I know I have this authority. I know I have whatever position it may be, but how can I serve? This is what Jesus was doing. Continues this. John 13 continues on. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and sat down again. And Jesus asked, do you understand what I've done for you? This is a remedial group, obviously, when he says, do y'all understand what just happened? Because they're all looking at him, and they're tripping on it. There ain't no doubt. The disciples are going, this is weird, man. They are tripping on the fact that Jesus just came in. You got to remember, why are they tripping? Because he has healed the sick. He has raised people from the dead. He has fed thousands when they had nothing. I mean, Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth, has done miraculous things, done amazing things in front of their eyes. They're following him because he's the leader, and he turns around, and instead of just saying, y'all need to bow to me, everybody should be bowed in here, he does the opposite. He serves them. And then he asks them, do y'all understand? Because they were tripping, I'm not sure they did. But then he makes sure it's extra clear for them and for us. John 13, 15. I've given you an example that you should what? So evaluate yourself. Think about this. You're the boss. Or you're in some position of authority. How do you operate? How do you work in your home? How do you work in your job? How do you work at school? Are you known for being a servant? Are you known for, hey, whatever I can do to help, however I can serve? Or are you the person, I'm in this position, man. You need to do what I ask you to do. You know how, this is the way to do it. You, you need to go do this, go do that. You need to be here. You need to be there. Or do you come in and go, man, how can I serve? See, Jesus knew that thousands of years later, for us even in this room, that it would apply to us today. He knew that we would all be tempted to be self-employed. Well, what do you mean? Well, I'm not talking about your job. I'm talking about that you think you're the boss of your life. You're not really going to listen to what he says or what he thinks. You just kind of go, I'm making the calls here. I'm making the decisions. So kids are trying to figure out what to do in college. Oh, I'm just going to decide where I want to go. Or you're trying to figure out your job. I just do what I want to do with my money. You know, ain't nobody, I made my money, I'm going to do what I want to do with my money. This is my house. You're going to do things the way I tell you to in my house because that's what you're supposed to do. This is my world. Self-employed. The boss of our life. And that is why when you see in Scripture, it often referred to Jesus as Lord. They didn't have the word boss, they had the word Lord. And that's why you've heard grow up in churches like he's the Lord of our life. 
in our terminology, we're like, no, is he really the boss of your life or do you still kind of make your calls because you're self-employed? This is why Jesus was telling the disciples, don't be tempted, boys, to be self-employed. Follow my example. Be a servant. Because he knew, Jesus knew, that those disciples, when Jesus ascended into heaven and the disciples went out into the world, that everyone would be filling their head. Dude, you're the man. Dude, you were with Jesus. They were going to be able to accomplish, Jesus said, even more than he accomplished. So he knew that there would be thousands of people listening to the disciples preach, he knew that there would be all these different environments. And he's like, guys, don't ever forget this. And I don't know how we've forgotten it. I don't know how we got off from this. But if you look at the modern world and the church that we're in today, and we look at our own lives as believers and followers in Christ, we're all tempted still to kind of say, it's my world. And this is why Jesus is going, pay attention Pay attention and understand that this is a big deal for you to say, I submit and I serve. I don't demand. I don't say it has to be my way. This is the example that he said, and he wanted the disciples to do the same thing. Now, to give you another illustration, this is all New Testament. This is Jesus. This is his followers, the best example, but I'm going to give you one more to make it a little bit clearer. We're going to go Old Testament, the front half of the Bible. To a guy that you're familiar with, his name is Moses. And you may remember Moses had kind of run from God and was kind of not sure what he wanted to do. He was wanted to be the boss of his own life. Gone through some different things, some hard times, but he had kind of pulled away. And then God comes to him and he asks him a very important question. Look at this, Exodus 4. God asks Moses, what's in your hand? He says, a shepherd's staff. Now, Every time I look at that passage, there's a couple of things that happen. But number one, I'm like, is God blind? Why is he asking that? But then this is the real reason. This is the second part of that. No, God's not blind. He's asking because the same thing that he's asking Moses would apply to us to this day. What do you have in your hand? Well, you go, what are you talking about? Well, let me make it clear. Let me tell you what this shepherd's staff represented for Moses. Number one, if you were to think, like, what is it about? It's his identity. Many of us get our identity from the job that we do, whether that's the company you work for or your position. You wear a uniform or you wear a suit or you wear a lab coat or you're a mom and you go, this is my identity. I, this is who I am. Well, that's what Moses was thinking when he was holding that staff. Then the other thing is, is your income. It's what you're paid. So if you're in a company, you make a certain amount of money, you get certain perks for that. And so you kind of go, man, this is who I am. And God knows that. If you're some other position, maybe it's just other things other than money that's your income, your words or whatever it may be. And you're like, man, this is who I am and this is what I do and this is how I get paid. But then the third thing is it was also his influence. That shepherd's staff represented what he was doing and how he could influence the sheep. This was his job. It was influence. It was income. It was his identity. So God was asking, what do you have in your hand? And then he goes on to the next part. Are you ready? And then the next part that's very difficult for us to read today, if you understand, throw it down on the ground then. Let it go. Let it go. And so Moses threw the staff. So here's the challenge. Moses was caught. Here's God saying, hey, I see your job. I see your identity. I see your income. I see your influence. But are you willing to throw that down so that I can do something with you in your life that you never in your wildest dreams thought was possible? In the same way, it comes back to us. This is where Jesus was going. Hey, guys, remember, he had to do the same thing with all his followers. Are you willing to let those things go, guys? And they did, but now he's following back up in this moment where they're in the upper room, and he says, now let me, you left your job, boys, but don't forget to keep washing feet. See, because the temptation is, is as you go in life, you may remember and then you forget. You may kind of get it, and then you're like, I'm not sure about it. 
Moses is the same way now. Now all of a sudden he's going, all right, here I am. Am I willing to let it go? And then when Moses threw it down, what happened next? The miraculous, that's what happened. When the disciples listened to Jesus and they followed and they became servants, what happened next? The miraculous. You're sitting in one of the things that happened. The church was born because they were servants. You wouldn't even be here today if it wasn't for the disciples. Serving and setting that example. And this is what's crazy. You may think, well, I don't even know. When you say miraculous, what do you mean? Well, you remember that Moses also split the Red Sea. Do you need something in your life that seems impossible, that seems like there's no way it can happen? And you think you're going to strive to make it happen? You're just going to work harder or you're going to fix it? When the reality is, is even as I said last week, you got to say, no, Jesus, I'm just a servant. I'm not the boss. I'm not the one in authority. I submit to your authority. I don't want it. I want to do what you ask me to do. That is a difficult thing to do, but yet when we're able to do it, you see God do things that you cannot do on your own. It's miraculous. So let me ask you a very heavy question. What's in your hand today? What is it that you're holding on to? What is it you think you've got to make happen? What is it that you go, man, if it wasn't for me, this isn't going to, no, no. What do you have in your hand? I'll ask you a secondary question. Who is the boss? of your life, of your family, of your career. See, when you start reading these examples, sometimes we just get lost and we hear the story and go, that's kind of cool, but we don't want to apply it to where we are. And this is where I'm working through this as well. 12 years of Simple Church, I don't want to be the boss. Every once in a while, somebody will joke and they go, oh, here's the boss, man. I'm like, oh, I don't even like that word. And maybe it's just me that I view as a bad word. What I want to be is, is like, man, God, help me to be like you. Help me to be a servant. God, help me to not think it's all about me or this is what we want in life. It's like, God, how can I continue to humble myself and wash feet? And that's why in the history of Simple Church, we've done it the way we've done it. That's why we're talking about Lighthouse. Now, I know the announcements, not everybody pays attention to it, but that's what Lighthouse is about. It's like, an opportunity for you to lead your family into it's not about you. To serve kids battling cancer, to wash feet. That's why in a couple of weeks we're going to be putting shoes back on the feet of children in this community that don't have anything. Why would I do that? Because it's another reminder through the actual act of serving to God. It's not about me. How can we serve? How can we give back? You could go through year after year, example after example, thing after thing. Why? Because I know that if you and I get there, it changes us, it changes our families, it changes our community because we're following the example of Jesus. But in order to do that, you have to let down your staff. You got to let down your income, your, sometimes it costs to make these things happen. You got to spend money to put shoes on kids or to go on these trips to change the world or to change our neighborhood, to invest in buying these shoes for these kids. It costs money, so you're like, okay, here's my income. Here's my identity, God. I mean, I'm not really comfortable with that. That's not really what I'm known for, but I'll let down my identity and I'll become that servant. My influence, maybe it's that you have influence over a certain group of people that if you invite them or if you ask them to help, then all of a sudden your influence could be used for something way bigger than you could have ever thought. It can change the world for a kid or for a family or maybe even for the person that you've invited. But see, you got to go, okay, here I am. I'll just be the servant. God, help me, show me, use me. That's my prayer for me, for my kids, for my life, for my wife, for all of us, and for us as a church. And it's one thing to read it, Old Testament and New Testament. It's another thing to see it. And you know I love using videos, and usually by now I've already shown you two or three different videos, but I've saved them all for the end into one video of one man's life, of what this looks like in the modern world. Well, you go, what do you mean? His influence, his income, his identity. 
was thrown down. Now, it wasn't even my choice. To be fair, sometimes God does things that don't make sense. But when he does, there's always an opportunity to use it for something awesome, for something good, for something powerful. But it's all in how we look at it. It's all in what we choose to do from there. And because, again, you need a modern day example, there's no better example than Inky Johnson. And when you see this video, understand this. Listen close. All of the effort, all the energy. I'm the boss. I'm going to figure it out. I can make this happen. And watch what God does. And watch how it changes his life. Watch this. And I come into my junior year, and I'm about to get exactly what I wanted. About to get this thing called NFL. And I'm 10 games away from this dream that I wanted my whole life, right? This thing that I've been working for my whole life. My whole life is dedicated to this one game. I'm up Saturday mornings, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, two miles to a fire station, two miles back home. I'm in the park, 9.30, 10 at night, doing everything in my life surrounded the game of football. I'm sitting at home at night. I'm throwing balls up to the ceiling, and I'm catching them different type of ways, trying to see if a receiver was to check me, if I wanted to catch an intercept. Like, everything revolved around this game, and I finally get in a position in my life to where now I'm 10 games away from it. I got the paperwork that states I'm about to be an NFL draft pick. NFL on top of the paper. Inky Johnson projected top 30 automatic multimillionaire. Now all you have to do, the hard part's over. Just play the next 10 football games, Ink. You, you, you made it. And I go out in a silly game against Air Force, two minutes left, and I go to make a tackle that I can make with my eyes closed. And I hit this guy, and as soon as I hit him, I knew it was a problem, but I didn't think it would be this type of problem. Like, you know how when things happen, you're like, ah, oh, I didn't expect that, but I don't think it's going to be anything too crazy. And when I hit him, every breath in my body left. My body goes completely limp. I fall to the ground. I blacked out. My eyes open. I'm still not, you know, too concerned because it's football. I told Pastor, I never thought about a career in an injury. You have injuries within the game. When my eyes open, guys run over, ink. let's rock, man, let's go. Let's finish him off. And I'm like, I, I can't. Like, what do you mean you can't? You're a starting corner. Get up. You can nurse your injury after the game, man. I'm like, no, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? I said, I can't move. It was a shock. Neck to my toes. I can't feel anything. Shock leaves. It stays in my right arm and hand. I'm like, maybe I got a bad stinger. They put me on the spine board, willing me off the field. Doctor says to me as he's walking beside me, I don't know how you're still alive, son. You don't have any pulse. We get to the ambulance. My father's standing there. I'm like, Pops, I laid it on him, right? I put it on him, right? My dad's like, yeah, but I think you got the worst part of this one, ain't? Doctor say, we're going to take you over, run a couple tests, bring you back into the room. Everything will be cool. They run the test. They bring me back into the room. Mom comes in, kisses, prays. Son, you'll be fine. She's going to walk out. Doctors rush in. Head boy says, hey, ma'am, got to rush him back to surgery. He's about to die. And I look at him, and I want to ask him, like, man, you can't use another word. Like, use a synonym, brother. <laughs> how y'all say die? Like, you sure die, man? And he could tell from how I'm looking at him that I'm questioning him. And he says to me, you ruptured a subclavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. If we don't perform this surgery tonight, I guarantee you, you won't be here in the morning. From seven years old to 20 years old, boiled down to one moment. The sacrifice, the dedication, the commitment came down to one moment. And the next morning I woke up from that surgery, the NFL on my scale of life, that big. SEC championship, that big. Cornerback, that big. I was embarrassed. I'm sitting there and people coming into my room like, Inky, man, um, I'm sorry about what happened to you. And I'm saying to myself, uh, man, Inky, you really messed it up this time. Like, man, that's really the only thing you wanted, huh? Like, you just thought because you grew up in this um, so-called hood, two-bedroom home, 14 people. 
Like, the only thing you really wanted was the NFL. That's it. I'm like, man, you limited God to that? Like, life holds no substance, no value. Like, efficient but not effective. I did things right, but I never did the right thing. And now the thing I placed my identity in, now it was gone. That's why I laugh at people when they say, man, if I could just get this, I'll be. Man, if I could just get this position, I'll be. Woo! Man, if I could just get this amount of money, I'll be. I'm like, woo. But what happens even if you get it or you don't get it? What happens when God says yes and no? Like, do you have the ability to accept what you don't understand? Can you still see God's plan when it didn't go the way that you thought it would go? Can you handle when things get off course? I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, like, man, I'm eight games away and God is redirecting me. And I'm like, God, just let me get to the NFL, then redirect me. Like, let me get the contract, then redirect me so I can help my family. And God is like, no, son, I need you to really go that way. And I'm like, you sure? Like, man, I need to go this way. He's like, no, I need you to go this way. I got something greater for you. Now, it might take a little longer to manifest, but I got something even sweeter. Like, I got something more fulfilling. I got something more rewarding. I got something, son, that's going to carry you for the rest of your life. Like, it's an amazing thing. I knew this was what I was supposed to be doing when one day I'm backstage and I got the same feeling that I got when I used to be in the tunnel before I was running out of Neyland Stadium. And I said, thank you, God. And so now I live my life a certain type of way according to what God has done. I live my life a certain type of way according to the power that I know the Lord possesses. I live my life a certain type. Like when I go to the Lord in prayer, I go bold. And every time I go bold, I'm so thankful that that's not me and my Lord's first time communicating. And people have the nerve to ask me all the time, Inky, why wouldn't you change what happened to you? You got a paralyzed right arm and hand. I'm like, if you only knew and if you only saw the works that God has done in people's lives around me, what he's done in me, yeah, it's great, it's cool. But what God has done in the people's lives around me, like you can't put a price on that. Like, at a certain point, like, what is it really about? Like, and I know the initial reaction when we go through things is to say, man, why did this have to happen to me? And it's an honest reaction. Because sometimes good people go through some crazy stuff. And some of the things we go through, I'm going to just be real, it's not, a, it's not a scripture for it. It's not. You can't go, hey, go to Romans 2-2. They're like, what? It's not. But this is what I've understood. In life, some people don't need you to preach a sermon. They need you to live one. And so when they see you living it, they can connect and identify with that. And so when ESPN comes to me and say, hey, you wouldn't be in the NFL right now? I'm like, if you only knew. If you only knew my father got saved because of my injury. If you only knew. My three boys that went first round to the NFL, all of them got saved. If you only knew. If you only knew my mother, the level of effect, like if you only knew. Like I just seen God do some things through the injury and I'm like, man, I just, every day I wake up, I just try to stay out of his way. Is that not an amazing story? <laughs> if you only knew. If you only knew, what would happen when you threw down your staff? When you bowed down to wash the feet? When you relinquished control? That's what Jesus was saying to the disciples. That's what God was saying to Moses. And that's what they're saying to us today. We all want to be self employed. We think we know what's best for your life, for your kids, for your future, for your business. We know, we know, and we try to control it, and we try to figure it out, and God's going, no, nah, you don't know. Will you, will I take my income, my identity, everything that's in me, got my influence, and throw it down and get down and wash feet? Jesus tried to make it clear over and over again to all of us. Mark 10, 
43. But among you, it will be what? Different. But among you, it will be different. Different. You see, because it won't be, look at me and give me, and I need this. It's like, how can I serve? How can I give? How can I use my income, my influence, my identity to serve? So this is my question. You see, Inky, if he only knew, if you only knew, so what are we, me and you, doing with those three things? You see what Inky's doing now is income, his identity, his influence. Changed everything. He had worked his whole life for that moment. But God's going, no, no, no. Now my hope and my prayer is that we don't have to go through some tragic, difficult circumstance to get the point. Unfortunately, some of us do. But today is an opportunity to go, no, God, I want to do it now. Oh, you're not walking an aisle. You're not signing a card. We're talking about your life. We're talking about when you walk back out those doors today, that it's something that happens on the inside. That you get to that point where you seriously say, God, I'm not the boss. And I want you to take over. My future is your future. I want what you want. Show me, lead me, guide me. And let me tell you what he's going to lead you to. Surrender and service. And then in those moments, he will guide and direct you. And you will see the miraculous. And I don't want you to miss it. And I want our church to experience it and our families to experience it in a way that changes this community and changes this world. And how does it do that, Justin? Because mamas and daddies are different. Because people who own companies are different. Because the leaders in school and the leaders in politics are different. It's about how can I serve? I'm not talking about lip service. I'm talking about genuine opportunity to get down on your knees and wash feet. And when we do, God says, man, that's what I'm looking for. And that's how we change the world that we live in. Father, I pray for me, God, that you would help me to continue my life striving to be like you. I have weaknesses. I fall short. I make mistakes. And God, I don't want to go down that road. I want you, God, to continue to show me the value and the importance of getting on my knees. And God, as, as I try to figure that out and lead that way, I pray that people would see us as genuine as, as can be, that we are trying our best to give them opportunities to do that in their home or in these workplaces or the schools that they're in. But God, that's our heart is to be like you. And to give our income, our identity, our influence and say, God, do with it whatever you can. God, it's yours anyway. Just you do it. Let us get out of the way, God. And when we do, we will see things that we never thought was possible. The miraculous. Thank you, God, that people came here today to sit and listen. But God, let it go beyond listening. Let it be action. Let it be our life. Let it be our story. And help us, Jesus, to... Walk out of these doors and change the world for you and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can I get an amen somewhere? Come on, one time. Let me tell you why I paused at the end. Before the doors open, everybody rushes out of here. Think about what we just heard. Think about your life and your family and your kids and your business and your community. Dude, it can happen if we really do do it. So don't walk out here and go, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I got it. No, really pray, God, show me. Let him lead us into that place, all right? I am so thankful that you're here, that you watch online, that you listen. But don't miss next week. It's another message that everyone needs to hear, all right? If you need to get a life group information, maybe that's the way you use your influence. Maybe that's the way you use your time. If you want to put some money towards helping kids with cancer or putting shoes on kids, that's another way to do it. This is your opportunity. Don't miss it, all right? I love you. And until next week, what do we say? Peace. Peace. Have a great day. Thanks for coming.